Okay, um, so it's three o'clock. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, this disembodied voice is uh, Sam Westwood. Um, so I just wanted to show you this slide quickly before we crack on with today's uh, um, talk. Um, this is just a list of the past and upcoming uh, Riots Talks, May through to July. Um, so today, obviously, we're joined by Talia Arcani. Um, I will share the um, Google Doc so that you can uh, take a look. Uh, there are a few uh, links in there for you to check out, particularly the link to our OSF page where you can see slides from previous talks and our YouTube page where you can see um, uh, the recordings of those talks. Uh, you can also check out our website. It is still being populated, so um, be patient with us. One thing to just draw your attention to is the um, the Open Research Conference. So if you uh, click on there, you will see, um, uh, in fact, what I might do is just do it now. So we have uh, a wonderful conference coming up uh, in June. Uh, these are the speakers and the idea is just to basically define the, the problem with uh, basically science. Uh, what are the solutions that we have to help? And it's a whole day conference and that's on the 11th of June. So I will stop with the, the, the plug and uh, what I might just do is send myself live and just quickly introduce our speaker. So hello everyone. Um, so today we are joined by uh, Tal Yarkone, and he's going to give us uh, a, a talk on the generali generalizability crisis, which is a sort of uh, uh, a, a car crash that's uh, really um, not really been having much discussion about it. And so it's really good to have an eloquent uh, writer and speaker discuss this sort of uh, unspoken of issue in psychology, but also science more broadly. So uh, Talia Oconi is uh, a research associate professor at the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, his act academic work focuses developing new tools and methods for the analysis of psychology and neuroimaging data. He does lots of stuff to create open source software tools, and he writes quite a lot of papers on methods. He's probably better known for his um, insatiable um, uh, uh, need for ice cream, um, which uh, I have to say I do share. So that's one thing I have in common. Um, so anyway, that's me nattering on enough uh, jokes. So Tal, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Um, thank you again for putting some time aside and the floor is yours. So I'll hand over to the AV team. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so. OK, yeah, here we go. All right there, hopefully everyone can hear me and see a, uh, a title. Um, so thanks for having me. It's, uh, this is great. It's actually probably the first time I've given, given a talk in the UK uh, and not been jet lagged. Uh, although it's a little bit early here, so it's a little a little like jet lag. Uh, so yeah, so this is a, a talk that uh, is going to mirror the paper fairly closely. So if you've read the paper, uh, I just saved you an hour. You can just go eat ice cream or do something else. Um, if you haven't, then I probably will save you reading the paper. So you win either way. Um, I have changed the introduction a little bit, um, just I think uh, make, make the art central argument sort of maybe a bit clearer. And so I'll start with a hypothesis, right? And, and this could be any hypothesis you like. I'll pick a fairly random generic hypothesis, which might be appropriate for some areas of social psychology. But most of what I'll say will apply uh, fairly straightforwardly to whatever hypothesis you, you care to substitute. Uh, let's say my hypothesis is something like the following. Um, higher social status disposes people towards le less ethical behavior, right? So I'm, I'm not the only person who's had this hypothesis, but let's say that's my, my, uh, my argument here. And I build a, a fairly elaborate verbal theory, but at its core, that's really the, the kind of the claim I'm making. Now, uh, I'm not a pundit. I don't think I'm a pundit. Um, having a theory is not sufficient. I also want to to uh, to test it. Right? I'm a scientist, so I want to go out and test this hypothesis and I, ideally evaluate it against the world and not just my own sort of beliefs um, a priori. Uh, 
So the question is, how do I do that? And what I'm going to do here is walk you through several kind of approaches you could take, all of which I think are actually reasonable under different assumptions, uh, but which differ quite a bit in, in sort of where they lead you and what the implications are. So the first thing um, you can do, approach number one, is, is we'll just call intuition. Right? So I, I told you I have this hypothesis, and I just sort of sit there for a while and I think, hmm, does this theory seem right to me? And I can evaluate all kinds of anecdotal evidence. I can imagine what things would be like if I did this, if I did that. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm just asking the question, does this seem right to me? And in this case, the answer is yes. Yes, it does. It seems, it seems very accurate and reasonable. Um, but it turns out maybe other people are not so convinced by this. Um, and so you might be thinking, well, that's great for you, but I don't know what's in your head. The fact that it seems reasonable to you doesn't help me. You need to operationalize this claim, right? So show me some objective thing out there that I can also look at and say, oh, okay, here's my evaluation of that. And that typically in science is where data comes in. So, um, you know, you, you make that argument and I say to you, fine, fine, we'll collect some data. So I design and run a study to test this hypothesis. And the study, of course, is going to have specific measures of social status and ethical behavior. Um, it's going to have some particular experimental procedure. Maybe it's an observational study. Maybe I manipulate status in some way. Uh, there are going to be specific materials involved. Participants will have to be sampled from somewhere. I'm going to have an experimenter or two or three and so on and so forth. And one critical point to note here, and I'll come back to this, is that the measurement context is necessarily going to be much narrower than the verbal constructs, meaning, you know, my theory is, is, is about social status and ethical behavior and this kind of pretty general uh, construct. But of course, I can't measure social status uh, perfectly uh, in, in the real world. I need to have a, an operationalization of that. And that measurement context I choose is, is almost inevitably going to be much narrower than the constructs I started out. With. So I'll come back to that. But the key point here is fine. We have some data now. And um, and now what? Now what do we do with this data? How does this help us evaluate or test that, that claim? Uh, and so the second thing we can do is we can just use our qualitative impression. So um, this is similar to approach number one, except we now have data. But still, I take my data, I look at it, and I think about it for a while. Maybe I look at this person, that person, I look at all the responses, and then I say, yeah, this thing's right, supports my theory. Um, and I'm happy. But other people are not happy. They're still not convinced. And they might say something like, look, yes, fine, okay, you're taking this literally. The data are objective, sure, but your impression is still entirely subjective. You're just telling us what you think this means. Um, and in, you know, in the same way that like, if, if I have no idea how many people are watching this talk right now, but let's say I, I, I've assembled everyone in a room and it looked like this. Um, you know, I could go to a friend of mine and say, yeah, I gave a talk to a really huge audience yesterday. And, um, and and they have no idea what I'm talking about. If I show them this picture, they might say, that's not a big audience. You should see what I give talks to. Uh, that's a tiny audience, right? And so it would be nice if there was some way, so you know, yes, there's, there's objective data there in some sense, but it'd be nice if there's some way to talk about this that is also a little more objective than just my qualitative impression. And that takes us to approach number three, which is descriptive statistics. So if you want objective evidence or argument and not just raw data, then you know I can solve that problem for you. I give you numbers, right? and so now I take that. Um, let's say I have, I have two groups. And say there's a manipulation of law. I take the high status uh, uh, group and I average their ethic score, ethical behavior score, and it's 22.6. And then I do the same thing for the low status group, and it's 25.4. And the low status is higher than that, the high status, and so my prediction is numerically confirmed, and I win, right? So my prediction was, remember, right, that the uh, um, ethical behavior or, or the, the high status people behave less ethically. And sure enough, that's what it turns out is the case here. So I win. Um, OK, great for me. It turns out a lot of people still are not convinced by this. Why not, you ask? I mean, look, there's the objective numbers and you know, I made a prediction. Well, the problem is that my theory, if you go back to you know, even just that one sentence, right? Um, my theory is, is almost certainly not about these particular people I sampled into the experiment. It makes general claims, and so it's not really obvious how much weight we should give the fact that I found 30 people in this group and 30 people in that group who show the effect I predicted. I mean, that's wonderful, um, but what do I do with that, right? If you want to make claims about the world beyond that, that's not sufficient. And so where this leads us is approach number four, which is to use a branch of statistics called inferential statistics. And 
Inferential procedures, by definition, involve generalizing beyond the confines of our sample. So the only reason that we have things like p-values, base factors, et cetera, is because we want to say something more. We don't want to just say, like, this group mean is x and this one is y. We want to be able to say we think this represents something broader and something that, that might generalize to a new observation. Because if there isn't any generalization, then um, we, what, it's not clear why we care. Right? We already know the answer for the participants we had in our sample. Um, so we have we know the fact of the matter. What, what more do we need to, to you know, what, what use is, is that to us if we're looking ahead and trying to make predictions about the world? So uh, we use inferential statistics. And the key question this then brings up is if you want to generalize from the sample to some population, what is that population? Right? What population is it that we are trying to make claims about? Now, uh, people will sometimes make uh, one of the following uh, or give one of the following answers to this question. And these are both, I think, fairly nonsensical answers. One thing you can say is it doesn't matter. Right? I'm not actually trying to generalize, right? I don't really care what the population is. That's a perfectly reasonable position, but if you if that's your position, you don't need inferential statistics, right? You can stick with approach number three. If you don't care to generalize, just say you're only interested in the sample. You don't need a p-value. Your life is much easier. You never have to explain, you know, what the statistical model that generated this statistic is. People understand these. That's very simple, right? So, so uh, you can save yourself a lot of trouble that way. Um, but if you if you want to use inferential statistics or you think you have some reason to, then it does kind of actually matter what the population is. Uh, you might also think, well, yeah, I get the idea, but I don't actually know. I don't know what, what, what population um, I'm, I'm trying to generalize to. That's a bad place to be in because if you don't know, what makes you think that your statistical model is magically going to solve the problem for you? It's kind of saying, I don't know what my theory actually refers to, but here, let me come up with a, a, an equation uh, and that'll tell me what I actually think I need. Right? That's a, a fairly odd position to be in. Um, so I think those are not good, good answers. And if you find them intuitive, then you might want to stop and think about, about um, what you're actually using inferential statistics for. Um, I think the fact of the matter is this. If you plan to use a p-value or a base factor or any other kind of inferential statistic to make an argument or to support a claim about the world, um, it's kind of important that the population that the model refers to and I'm not saying there's an unambiguous interpretation of what a model means, uh, but there are you know, reasonably well understood interpretations. Um, it's kind of important that that mean more or less the same thing, that it referred to the same populations, at least roughly, as the verbal claim you started out with, if you're a psychologist. And so we can think of this as really what we're trying to do is align universes. Um, we can, borrowing a terminology from, uh, from generalizability theory, we can say that every hypothesis has an associated universe of intended generalization. When you make a claim like uh, high status people behave less ethically, um, implicitly there is some set of observations that would satisfy that claim. And if you ask me, does this fall into your theory? I might say no. And if you say, well, how about this situation? I might say yes. And it's not, it doesn't have to be unambiguous. And obviously this is sort of an idealization, but there has to be at least a sense that yes, you know, you could in theory at least sketch out what kinds of observations you're talking about. Otherwise, what is a theory, what is it good for? Right? If you can't tell me when it applies, uh, it's sort of just like playing with words. Um, and this is true, again, of the statistical model as well. The statistical model defines some hypothetical population implicitly that it refers to. And for a result, statistical result to support the verbal claim, these two things have to align. And it's very easy to show this by counterexample. It's just very, I'll prove this to you right now. It's very simple, right? So. Imagine I, that I took this theory, I, I, you know, somebody might say, well, that's not a theory, that's just a vague hypothesis. Doesn't matter, you can substitute something else if you want. But I say my theory of status effect on ethical behavior predicts that adults should be taller than children, p less than 0.05. Um, this would be ludicrous. If you were asked to review a paper that seriously tried to argue that, uh, you know, the theory is supported on the basis of the fact that um, adults are taller than children, p less than 0.05, which of course they are, you would throw this out. You'd say, well, that's absurd because the one has nothing to do with the other, right? Why would you think that, that a difference in height between adults and children has any informative value for the theory of uh, theory about status effects, right? And what you're actually doing there, in a sense, is saying these things are not aligned. The meaning of the statistic, when you test, when you do the t-test, um, and you get that p-value, that just does not reflect anything to do with the same kinds of observation, hypothetical observations, as the theory I started out with. Right. So clearly there has to be a relationship between these things. We don't say, um, you know, my you know, X is my support for Y if X has nothing to do with Y. It's a very strange position. 
So the question I'll take up most of the rest of the talk is, or at least the next 20 minutes, is how well do statistical and verbal hypotheses typically align in psychology? Uh, and I'm going to make the case that they don't align well at all, that it's actually quite easy to see that. And let me start with a, a really bad model. Um, um, let's say we wanted to analyze data from a Stroop task. I'm going to assume for the sake of time, everybody knows what the Stroop task is. If not, you can look it up. Um, but you can substitute almost any task you like here and it will work just as well. Um, so the hypothesis in the Stroop or one hypothesis uh, classically is that people take longer to respond in the incongruent condition than the congruent condition. Right? This is well established, been almost 100 years and maybe 90 years of work on this at this point. Um, so that's the, the kind of the hypothesis we're trying to test. And the question is, what statistical model should we use? And you have all the choice in the world, but here's one possibility you could have, have chosen. You could have, have said, here's my model of uh, Stroop responses. So I'm uh, my prediction for the for subject I's J trial um, is the sum of the following. There's a, a, a global intercept, right? So this is just the mean of all the trials I have, um, plus uh, some coefficient on the, the the condition. So that's essentially the slope. That's the Stroop effect, as it were, is this beta one. Um, Xij here is just the, the actual condition that the trial J is assigned to for subject I. Right? So this is just an indicator telling us which condition it's in. And so if it's uh, congruent or if it's incongruent, we just multiply it by the, the beta. And uh, if it's in the other condition, we, we just add zero. And then we have some normally distributed error. Right? That's the assumption. So that's a very simple model. You could certainly use this to analyze your Stroop data. This is a very bad model for Stroop data under conventional assumptions. Why? I would normally ask the room this, but I can't ask the room this, so I will tell you why. Uh, one reason it's bad is that it assumes all trials are generated by the same process. And to see that, just observe that there is nothing here, right? nothing at all, uh, there's no information at all about where these trials come from other than condition. So all, we're, all we know is that there's, there's really only two parameters that are giving us our, our predicted response here the intercept, which is the global mean over all trials, and which condition the trial is from. And that's it. There's no, no accounting for any other factor, nothing at all about how the trial is generated. And we know that's a really bad, bizarre assumption because for one thing, uh, we know that people differ considerably in their mean responses on almost any task in psychology, right? So um, we know that some people are faster than others. Some people have a larger Stroop effect, but this model takes no account of that. And so that's a problem. And failing to account for known sources of variability, like the fact that we are sampling subjects who differ into our study, uh, means that our parameter estimates are likely to be biased. Um, that's that we don't know how, but they're, they're quite likely to be biased. Um, and more problematically, perhaps, uncertainty estimates will also usually be biased. Well, they'll, they'll always be biased. They typically will be biased downwards, almost always. Um, um, and that's bad because we don't want our, our model estimate to, to, to give us a false sense of certainty. Right? We don't want it to, to convince us that there's a huge Stroop effect um, when in fact um, we, we are not actually sure at all whether, whether there's an a, a effect on average in the, the, some, in the population of, of subjects we're sampling from. And a very intuitive way to see this, I think, is just, just consider that um, you know, if I asked you, give me a prediction for, for uh, the Stroop effect for the next person who walks through the door, you probably would prefer an estimate derived from, from 20 subjects, each with 200 trials, than from uh, one subject with 4,000 trials, right? It should be very intuitive to you that averaging over 20 subjects is probably gonna give you a better estimate of the population value uh, than one subject. It doesn't have to, it could be that I randomly selected, uh, luckily, like one subject whose, whose mean is exactly the populations, but it's unlikely. And so generally speaking, in most cases, you're gonna be better off if your goal is to make claims about some, some population broader than the 20 people in your study, um, you kind of want to account for that, that, that source of error, the fact that you're randomly sampling people into your study. It's just whoever showed up and signed up the experiment. Okay, so that's, that's a bad model, and we call this the fixed effects model for reasons that will become clear hopefully in a second. Um, a better model is the following. Um, okay, so now we're adding a bunch of terms here. And you'll notice it's, it's very similar to the previous model, but we have um, these two terms here, these these U terms, and what these are now doing is they're they're indicators for for these the subjects. So now we have a separate U uh, parameter for every every subject 
and we have a separate slope. So every subject is allowed to have their own intercept, right? They have their own mean, but they also have their own slope. Uh, every subject gets their own stroop effect. They can have a different difference between congruent and incongruent conditions. And those parameters we assume are coming from normal distributions again. So we're making the assumption that there's some underlying population we're sampling from. It's a normal distribution and we're sampling from it randomly. And that's what goes into our, our model. That's what shows up in our data. Right? So it's a, it's a very different model. And we refer to this particular model in psychology uh, conventionally as the random effects model. Um, by the way, this is approximated by the standard one sample t-test. So if you're thinking, well, uh, I haven't seen this before, but you're telling me this is like a super common model. That's because you get more or less the same thing if you just average over all the trials within every condition, within every subject. Um, and then you're, you're, you're basically end up um, where all you have left are these particular sources variance. These three variances are the only thing you have left. So they're not explicit, but the one sample t-test will give you uh, essentially the same thing as this model fitted to all the trials, trial data you have. Although this is probably the better way to go slightly. Um, okay, so just a couple more things about this model. I mentioned that the 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 the, the U-terms allow every subject to have their own intercept and stroop effect, which is good because we think that's probably realistic. Right? People do differ from one another. Uh, and again, we say that we're randomly sampling. The priors tell us that we're randomly sampling these subjects from some some latent population of interest. So this implies we care about the population of subjects like the ones we saw, and not exactly the ones we saw which the previous model assumed, right? The previous model, remember, has no concept of a subject, which is another way of saying it thinks that all trials are generated from exactly the same subjects that we have data for, right? That's a, probably a bad assumption. So this is what gives us, it's one way to, to, to support generalization to a population, is we have these random variables that explicitly in the model we're writing uh, that we're sampling from, from a distribution, right? So there's a population implied there. And usually this is going to be purchased at the cost of increased uncertainty and smaller test statistics. It's not guaranteed, but in most cases, given real data, it will turn out that when you add these extra terms, you increase uncertainty often considerably, as you'll see. Um, and so there's this going to be the trade off between estimation precision on the one hand and generalizability. Right? So how, how good are your estimates for a particular uh, 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 set of observations versus how how widely can you uh, say something about what these results mean. Now, is this intuitive? For most people, it's not. If, you, if, it, if, you, if it is, great, you're lucky. But uh, for most people, this distinction and this kind of modeling is not intuitive, but it is critical to understand because these are the these are the, the, the models that are you're using to support your claims. So let me just say a little bit about fixed and random effects. Uh, I mentioned these terms. There are different ways to talk about this distinction. Uh, but for my purposes, I will just say the fixed effects are of intrinsic interest. So they're things that we care about for the sake of themselves. And random effects are sampled randomly for some underlying population. So if a subject is fixed, you're saying I actually care about Susan's, specifically Susan's Stroop effect. Uh, if, if subject is random, you're saying Susan is of no interest to me, except insofar as she's a stand in for anyone else I might have randomly sampled. And the latter is generally what we, we I think, care about in, in psychology for the most part. Uh, another way you could put it is changing the fixed effects changes the interpretation of the model, but changing the sample levels of random effects does not. Right? If you change a fixed effect, it's no longer asking the same question, whereas you could sample a different set of subjects and you still would take yourself to be asking the same question. Um, OK. So um, a general point that this kind of gets us to is that inference is, is bounded which is to say statistical inferences are always dependent on the model. And this is a kind of deceptive and, and it's easy to, to forget because you, you well, verbally we want to say things like, well, there's a statistically significant effect of stroop condition. But that claim means something very different if it comes from model one or if it comes from model two. In model one, what it means is if you were to take those same subjects and just take more sets, more, more trials from those subjects, you per the same, using following the same sampling procedures, um, then you would expect to see a difference between stroop conditions. Right? That's a fairly weak claim. The second model allows you to say if you were to sample entirely new subjects, then on average you would expect to see a difference between conditions. Right? So the, the meaning is actually quite different. Even though sort of naively you might use the same phrasing, uh, you really need to think about what the claim you're implying about the world actually is. And it's quite different depending on your model. 
And again, so I'm just reiterating, the validity of the inference depends on the match between the model and the analyst's intention. And it's not that the, the random effects model is intrinsically better. It's not like fixed effects is terrible, random effects is good. It's that generally speaking, the random effects model better matches most people's inferential goals because you typically want to make claims about other subjects, not just the ones you saw in the study. Right? And so um, under most conditions, the random effects model is probably better, but it's not intrinsic. It's, it depends on your, on your intention, essentially. Now, that's fairly straightforward, at least if you've, if you've taken statistics before, you will in one way or another have covered this. Um, it might have been presented in a slightly different way. Um, um, but interestingly, in psychology, we tend to only model subjects as random, right? And you might say, well, why do we stop? Why stop at subjects? Uh, yes, the conventional random effects model is an improvement, but it's not correct. And remember, all models are wrong, right? So in some sense, no model is correct. Um, but the, the fixed effects model is really bad, and the model with only your subject is random is still pretty bad because we know that there's lots of other factors that vary stochastically and that we are going to behave as if we're generalizing over. Um, Think of stimuli. Do you want your conclusions to apply only to the stimuli in the, the, the study you ran? Probably not. You probably think that, hey, if you had sampled another face image um, that was slightly different, your conclusion would hopefully still apply. Uh, task implementation, right? You don't want it to be the case that only if you use that particular design with an uh, inner stimulus integral of 800 milliseconds does the effect apply. So if you vary that ISI a little bit, then all bets are wrong. Um, and so on, right? So, so we behave as if our, our results supported by our p-values and whatnot uh, apply fairly broadly, but we, our models don't actually include those, those terms. So the same exact logic applies here um, for all these things as for subjects. And I'll show you that this actually matters and has pretty dramatic implications. Uh, there's this, this, this uh, thing called the fixed effects fallacy, the stimulus fixed effect fallacy that goes back now almost 60 years uh, to Coleman and then uh, Clark uh, after that. Uh, and they pointed out that this problem that I just described is, is actually pervasive and occurs very widely in the context of stimulus selection psycholinguistics. Um, now, the, they focused on psycholinguistics, but this problem applies actually very, very widely throughout psychology and other fields. Uh, so as I just said, we model subjects as random, why not stimuli? We don't usually care about the specific stimuli in our study. We want to generalize to do stimuli like the ones we sampled. Um, and so if we use a model that doesn't include any term for that 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 generalization intention, then uh, bad things might happen. And so let me just give you the intuition and then I'll show you uh, what actually happens in practice. So suppose we randomly sample five nouns and five verbs into, let's say, a lexical decision task. Right? And our interest is in nouns versus verbs. We're interested in the categorical difference, but we can't get around the fact that we need to sample individual words. So we pick you know, these five nouns and these five verbs and then we go out and we, we collect data from the nouns for the verbs, and then we compare the two. Now, obviously these two verb groups are gonna differ in many ways other than just being nouns and verbs, right? They might differ in length, in spoken frequency, in orthographic neighborhood density, all kinds of things. There's hundreds of ways these, these two sets of words might differ. And the question is, how can we distinguish genuine differences in grammatical class from differences specific to the 10 sampled words? So, right, so, so how do we distinguish sampling error we could have picked different words that were still nouns and verbs and gotten very different results uh, from an actual true or genuine effect of the grammatical class, which is what we care about. And the conventional model we, we fit cannot do this. Right? Um, the solution is to model, or one solution is to model stimuli as random effects. And so exactly the same logic I showed you a few slides ago. And so um, uh, my ex postdoc and his former advisor, Chick Judd, uh, Jake Westball, uh, my ex postdoc did, did a lot of work in this area and very nicely showed, uh, so here's a simulation, and under reasonable assumptions, I think the assumption here is that the size of the variance, there's as much variance in the stimuli as in the participants. And under reasonable assumptions, you can see that if you have like, a small number of stimuli and a large number of subjects, you could easily get like 60% plus false positive rates. Another way to think about this is there is a true effect. It's not that there's not an effect. It's just that the effect is attributable to stimuli and not to the, the condition effect. Right? And so you would walk away from this if you use the wrong model thinking, aha, I win, p-value less than 0.05. And the problem is you're misattributing that. There's not actually an effect of, of grammatical class. It's an effect of, um, of the, the, the stimuli you sampled. Uh, 
And as your as your stimuli sets the stimulus sets get smaller and your participant sample gets larger, you basically put yourself in a position that you, you may depend, but you, you basically may be in a position where you, you basically cannot fail to reject the null, right? Like um, it's good. under reasonable assumptions, you might find yourself with like a 95% chance of rejecting the null, even though it's entirely driven by stimulus sampling. And that's a very bad place to be in. Um, let me skip over this. This is just making the point of real data. Um, here's, uh, we did this, so that was, Jake has done a lot of work in, in social psychology. We did a very similar thing with fMRI data. Uh, this is in simulation, just showing that if you have no variance in the stimuli, then you get your nominal alpha value. But if you have large stimulus variance, then lo and behold, again, you have a high false positive rates. And this is the effect it might have on your real data. So on the left are results you might see published based on a conventional model where all these brain regions light up and show an effect. Uh, but if you use the stimulus, the random stimulus model, then you get the right side here where you can see that uh, most of the stuff is wiped out. Notice down here you have this one study that looks very similar, and that's because this study had a large number of stimuli. So just like a large subject sample uh, helps you out, um, right? It sort of guarantees that your effect is not specific to any one or two subjects if you have lots and lots of subjects. Same thing for stimuli. So one sort of um, lesson is large n matters everywhere, right? Anything you want to generalize over, try and get a large sample if you can. Um, but hopefully this, this convinces you, and there's lots of work on this out there. Almost everywhere people have looked, it turns out stimulus variance is large in psychology, uh, and that's a problem. Um, all right, so, so we've done subject, we've done stimuli, now we can generalize this problem further, right? Because stimuli, again, just one factor we intend to generalize over and that we omit for most of our models, but there are lots of others. And this problem is going to compound, right? As you think of like research site, experimenter, task operationalization. And the critical question is, how big are these unmodeled variance components? And I think a moment's thought really should convince you that they're often quite big. Um, if you think of task variance, for example, now I would, put quite a bit of money on the, the claim that in, in most domains of psychology, the variance due to different operationalizations of the construct and different tasks you could use that seem like they measure the same thing is actually larger than the variance due to um, subjects. And yet we seem to largely care about subjects. And we know this, like I said, stimulus variance we know is really quite large in many domains. So um, it's not like this is like a, a hypothetical like or some pedantic thing you don't have to think about. It's very clear that in most domains of psychology, there are going to be lots of unmodeled variance components that are quite large, plausibly. So um, you kind of have to ask, how many studies model these things as a random factor? Right? And the answer is not many. Let me give you another example of how this would play out in practice and what this looks like. Um, because you might, let me, this, you can think of it from a statistical perspective, but you can also think about it just in terms of constructability and, and logical claims. So uh, here's something called a letter, letter cancellation task, which is widely used as a manipulation of eco depletion. You ask people in one condition to just cross off, let's say the, the C, all the C's and the E's. And in a second condition, you would say, well, cross off all the C's and E's unless they're preceded by a D or followed by an F, right? And so the latter condition is much more difficult and it reduces effort. And this is supposed to deplete people's mental energy and then you see downstream consequences if you give them another task, right? This is what ego depletion is supposed to be. So here's what this looks like. This is the causal pathway. You've got your manipulation here, induces ego depletion, and then you see a change in behavior. And this sounds wonderful, and you get PLS and 0.05 out here, and you think, great, this supports my, my theory of ego depletion. Um, but the problem is, think of all the other alternative explanations for this, right? So this manipulation isn't just manipulating ego depletion, if it's doing that at all. It also makes people probably passive aggressive. It's annoying to do a really difficult task. Maybe that's the change in behavior you're seeing. Um, maybe it changes response bias. People become more cautious following a difficult uh, task. Maybe they're just bored. That's not the same thing as being tired or depleted. Maybe they lack confidence. You give them a hard task, they're like, oh, I guess I'm not very good at this after all, right? And you can go on like this. There's hundreds of plausible explanations you could generate. And so you kind of have to ask yourself at the end of the day, right? given that, that you're equating ego depletion with just this one task, you didn't have an array of tasks that um, are all different operationalizations of the, the, that construct that you can then um, uh, triangulate on, on the, the latent variance. What do we learn from this? Right? So you confirm this physical prediction, great. P less than 0.05, the letter cancellation manipulation works. Um, 
what can you conclude about the verbal hypothesis of ego depletion? And the answer, I think, is pretty clearly almost nothing. Um, you certainly can't conclude that ego depletion is real, because remember, only one plausible ca causal pathway of potentially hundreds involves ego depletion. So it could be that ego depletion is not their zero effect. It could even be that ego depletion actually has the opposite effect, and it's just more than offset by all the other factors. You really can't say almost anything at all. And so why is this a useful test of the theory? Right? Um, so same problem, right? The problem here is that you're not formalizing in your model any representation of the thing you actually care about is distinct from all the things that you don't care about, right? The universe you're generalizing to is much, much broader than the one you actually think you care about. It gets still worse, unfortunately. Uh, in theory, right, you could say, okay, fine, we know what kinds of models we can fit to help address this problem. We'll just build in more and more variance components. Um, but the problem is that many of these are not measured. So if you did an ego depletion task, but you only have the one manipulation, you can't model variation in, in, ta in tasks because you only have one. So that's invisible to your model. Um, and the same thing for experiments, for sites, right? Most studies don't have multiple experimenters or multiple sites. Um, and as I said a few minutes ago, it's not just multiple. To be useful, you need many, just like you don't do a study typically with two subjects, right? Because you, you want the, the you want to build up enough data that you feel like the estimate you get by averaging over them is representative. Same thing applies. You would like to have many, uh, many sites, many experimenters, et cetera. And so we can formalize this by, by just thinking of the, the previous subjects of random effect model and just adding a bunch of missing terms here. These are all placeholders, right? So think of everything that anything that could potentially explain variance in your data. And you can add a placeholder term for it, random slopes, intercepts, whatever you like. Um, and the idea is that when you fit the traditional model, it's not that you're taking no stance, right? It's kind of, you kind of want to say, well, I'm, I have no opinion, right? I'm agnostic, but you're not agnostic. Your model, when you when you fit the conventional model, is actually assuming zero influence, right? That is actually a positive stance. You're saying, I believe that none of these other things matter as far as my data goes. The data generating process does not include these other things, right? So it is a positive position. You can't avoid the fact that the model has to say something about it. Um, and so, but this is just to show you that, that the same formalism in theory can, can expand arbitrarily, uh, bigly. It's just that you typically don't have access to those those um, those terms. So, where does this leave us? I think one sort of uncomfortable question we need to ask is like, what do our conventional statistics even mean in this kind of regime? Um, most of our papers in psychology report p-values. And by the way, I should have mentioned this. Everything I said applies equally to base factors, right? So this is not like a frequentist problem. Uh, it's an inferential statistics problem. If you are using a statistic that implies some broader population exists, then you have this problem, um, right? But most of our models are reporting p-values for, for universes of observations that we don't actually care about. I, I don't think anybody really cares. Nobody does a screw because they care about those 20 people who walk to, through the door. Those 20 people are supposed to be a stand-in or a proxy for some broader population. Um, and that's that's a problem, right? So if we were, uh, I think I would say, maybe a little strong to say, but if we were honest about how we reported our results and what they mean, then we would be saying things like, well, there's one task run by this one experimenter using this one set of stimuli at this one research site, using this one participant population. Look, there's a population there under these testing conditions produced results that would have less than 5% probability of occurring if generated by a random process that met the criteria I just described. Right? So if you randomly sampled stimuli but held everything else fixed, then the results would have less than 5% chance of occurring. That is very different from saying that you have evidence for ego depletion or for a Stroop effect or for status effects on ethical behavior. Right? There's a big gap between these things. And you might ask, is the latter even interesting? Uh, and I'm not taking a position on that. I think, you know, I hope it's interesting because if it isn't, then we have a problem. Um, but if you don't, if you don't report, if you if you're not careful about how you report these and you you sort of make the leap from I have this very, very narrow P value to I start out this broad claim, you kind of have to ask if that is even science, right? I mean, like, why do you need the, the P values at all at that point? And you're all familiar, I think, with this kind of notion of cargo called science that that uh, that Feynman introduced, right? Um, um, it is, I think, for better or worse, a good description of what's happening here. So um, there is a form here that we follow. We feel like we need to have a number, a statistic that tells us that what we're doing is good and that we have some certainty. But the relationship between 
that statistic and the actual claim is very, very tenuous. Right? And so as Feynman says, like we're doing everything right. The form is perfect. It looks just the way it should, but it doesn't work. The airplanes don't land. Um, and that's, I think, a, a very serious concern that we, we and, and not a new concern either. I mean, people have been pointing this out for a long, long time, but I don't think we've faced up to it um, fully, actually, almost at all in psychology. Um, let me say a little bit about the relationship here to other crises like the replication crisis, right? So um, what should we make of the fact that lots and lots of effects of psychology don't seem to replicate? Um, so my view is that there is a replication crisis and it's a serious problem. It's, it's a, it should concern us all that it's actually hard to produce uh, often even ballpark similar results from studies that have been published and often cited hundreds if not thousands of times. But I would argue this is secondary to the crisis of generalizability. Right? The generalizability problem is logically antecedent in the sense that it's not clear what the point is of replicating a study that has almost no informational value to begin with. Right? Um, if you look at if you look at the claim that was made in relation to the statistic that was reported, and it turns out that the one just does not support the other, why is it useful to go out and replicate that study? I mean, you might find that you can replicate the statistic perfectly. It still has no bearing on the, the claim, right? And so that I think should concern us a lot. And, and, and it's not just that, it's not even that it's just sort of an, an, an orthogonal problem. I think the focus on replication risks making things worse because what often happens is replication succeed. And if a replication succeeds in a case where the claim was just sort of essentially uh, unrelated to the statistic, then the real risk is of reinforcing incorrect conclusions. And we see this, right? We see this all, all over the place. So there's a registered replication report a few years ago, a verbal overshadowing that concluded in the abstract, the authors found a robust verbal overshadowing effect. That study done by Schooler and Schooler uh, in 1990 used exactly one stimulus, right? And so you have, and this was a replication of I think 30 sites. So you have massive expenditure of effort to replicate an effect with one stimulus that could never have plausibly justified the claim in the first place. And so it doesn't seem like that's a good use of our resources. Right? It seems like the first thing we should do is determine whether the reported result actually informs the hypothesis. And only if it does that do we then say, OK, let's let's see whether this actually can be replicated. Right? Um, so these are both important things to address, but I think one is logically prior to the other. And, and, and there's a real risk, I think, that focusing on replication uh, just leads us to ignore or the fact that, that we're spending a lot of resources on studies that just, even if they were exactly as reported, would not support the original claim. Okay, so that's the problem. Um, and the question is, and I spent a third of the papers we're talking about, like, what do we do? Where do we go from here? I hasten to say that these are not new insights. There's very little in that in my paper that's new. Um, the core logical problems have been discussed by Paul Neal as far back as like the 60s. Uh, the fixed effect fallacy I mentioned goes back to at least Coleman and Clark in the 60s and 70s. Generalizability theory is introduced, I think, even in the 50s or some of the 60s. Um, this idea that statistics, we're using statistics as ritual. Uh, Gigerenzer has talked about for decades. Gelman has been talked about like this a lot as well. So really, none of the ideas I've talked about are new. I'm not taking credit for any of the, the what I, did, what I just described. Um, but it should concern us a lot, I think, that not much seems to have changed in the last 50 years, right? You read Meal 1967, and it's just as applicable today. Um, and that, I think, is, is a real concern. So what should we do? Um, and so I'll give you a series of, of mutually independent um, suggestions. I'm not saying that, like, you know, all of them apply or any apply, but just things to think about. The first thing I think is it's perfectly reasonable to say, look, um, in the face of these kinds of problems, um, maybe we should do something else, right? Not every story has a happy ending and not every question that can be asked can be answered. And even questions that can be answered in principle may not be worth it in practice. Um, so there are lots of domains of psychology I think, where if we really appreciated how hard it is to properly address the questions we're formulating, we might not be interested. And I think that's reasonable, right? I think that we owe it to taxpayers to not pursue questions that we don't feel um, actually justify the expense. Um, so it's perfectly reasonable to walk away. I've certainly changed my research program a couple of times when these kinds of uh, concerns arose, um, and I thought what I'm doing maybe is not going to produce the kinds of answers I would like. Um, so you can do that. I don't think there's any shame in that. And I think it's important to remember that you always have the option, right? Like you're not forced to do uh, any particular kind of work. Um, a second thing you could do is you could embrace 
approaches uh, one through three that I started out with, right? Uh, and when I say this, people think I'm being pejorative and saying, oh yeah, you can be a qualitative researcher if you want. But I'm not saying that at all. I actually think legitimately qualitative analysis is super important, super valuable, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And it's, in my view, much better to accept that and, and say, yes, I'm doing qualitative psychology, I'm gonna do it carefully and, uh, and with rigor, than to uh, present what is essentially qualitative analysis with a p-value and say that somehow this has turned it into quantitative science, right? Um, um, and I think given the, the lack of falsifiability or the vagueness of many, many theories in psychology, um, it's not obvious that you actually benefit much from the p-values anyway, right? So a lot of theories I would argue are, are, are sort of clear. You, you, they don't need empirical data. You can reason about them qualitatively and logically and come up with, again, interesting claims. I'm not saying this is not worth doing. I just am not convinced that much of what we do requires empirical data. Um, okay. Uh, now, a third thing you can do, and this is, I would say, by far the easiest solution to the problem, is just to not, not extrapolate beyond the support of the results. Um, so sometimes when I present these arguments, people say, yeah, but look, this is just kind of hopelessly unrealistic, right? Because you're saying that like you can always add more random effects, you can always build a bigger and bigger model. At some point, you have to say stop. And that really mischaracterizes the argument. Um, nothing says so, right? So, so the argument is that you have to align your verbal hypothesis and your statistical hypothesis, but nothing says that you have to hold the verbal hypothesis fixed and only vary the statistics. It's actually much easier to do the opposite. So fit the model. If you can't do better than subjects with random effects, that's the model you fit. Just moderate your verbal conclusions so you can change your verbal hypothesis to reflect that. You can say, we are not, uh, we, we do not have license to generalize beyond the stimuli we used in this in the study. It's very easy. Actually, it probably saves you effort because it's, if you look at discussions in, in a lot of papers, a lot of it is sort of speculative and goes beyond the support of the data. Um, so this is actually a very practical suggestion that if anything cuts down on work, right? So if your words and stats don't match, yes, you can change the stats. Alternatively, you can use different words. That's perfectly fine. Instead of saying we have evidence of ego depletion, why not say we provide evidence that crossing out the letter E slightly decreases response accuracy on a subsequent screw task? And then you can go on to say, and now we speculate wildly about what this means, but it's clear to the reader at that point that you're speculating wildly and maybe they shouldn't trust what you have to say. It's certainly not coming out of the p-value. Um, related prescription is to take description more seriously. Um, we unfortunately, I think, stigmatize a lot of descriptive work in psychology, and I think that's quite unfortunate. I think we should show a lot of respect for large, well-designed studies that do nothing but descriptively report associations, right? Because that's sort of grist for the mill. I mean, you can't really build, at least in, in um, areas of psychology like social, parts of developmental, and many others, you can't really, I think, build theories of these very, very complex phenomena until you have very elaborate and very comprehensive uh, uh, sort of you know, surveys of the, the space of observations. So we should have much more respect for descriptive work than we do, I think, um, because generalization, at least in soft psychology, demands a lot of data. Uh, now, I already mentioned this, of course. Another thing you can do is fit more expansive models. Um, in, in principle, right, ideally, every experimental facet that you've measured and that you intend to generalize over should be random in your model. If you have multiple stimuli, and you're going to behave as if your results don't apply just to the four faces you had, but to a class of faces like those, then you should model those as random. It's sort of implied, right? Again, you're, you're sort of, you're in a sense, being dishonest because you're saying that your results show X when actually they show something much narrower. Um, what would be really helpful for the field at large, I think, is to report the relative sizes of different variance components. So we don't tend to do this because we don't, you're not usually, we're not, interested in invariances, we're usually interested in means. We take means to inform our hypotheses, but it's actually super important to know in this data set how much of the variance proportionally was explained by stimuli versus subjects versus experimenters. And meta-analysis of this are essentially non-existent. I mean, in a sense, that's what heterogeneity statistics are, right? but rarely do you see people formally frame in terms of like, I want to know for these classes of, of, uh, of uh, sources of variance, um, how big are they and how much do they matter? That would be super useful if you're designing a new study and now you know, oh, in this domain, it looks like stimulus variance uh, is really large, so I should worry about that, right? Whereas maybe site variance is really small, so I don't have to worry about that. That would be very helpful. Um, uh, we can design to maximize variation. So there's a long tradition in psychology of, of striving for greater experimental control, 
you kind of try to match all your conditions on everything except the dimension you care about. And um, the trade-off there, again, is, is estimation precision versus generalizability. And so maybe we should pursue, to some degree, designs to maximize variability. And there's now been lots of calls for this in, in all sorts of domains, be it uh, naturalistic designs of fMRI, psycholinguists have started uh, doing these mega studies that use the multiple sites, and just enormous samples of data, and vary lots of things explicitly, um, and so on. Uh, you get greater ecological validity, and it makes it much easier to assess robustness to variation in irrelevant factors. Right? You can't model the effect of something that you don't see. Um, a really nice example of this is in the study by Barabo et al. Um, we replicated an early subliminal priming study, but instead of just replicating the exact finding as it was, what they did was they varied 16 different factors. So these are things like the forward mask duration and the mask Q duration and the Q color, right? Things that you might think shouldn't happen to be effects, but this gives you a way of, of evaluating whether they, they have an effect or not. And so they have these thousands and thousands of what they call micro experiments. And you'll notice that many of them uh, don't produce any meaningful effect, but some large subset of them do. And then you can quantify that and look at um, what how much of the variance these different factors explain. And you can see that some of them explain essentially none. So good, you now know that in this, at least in this particular paradigm, maybe you don't need to worry about the color of the stimuli, right? That's important, you've learned something. Whereas some of these other things are actually quite important, like the Q duration, it's not surprising, right? The, the, the duration of the mass Q might matter. Um, uh, and so now you have a much better sense of under what conditions do, does this effect hold? And you're in a much better position to make claims um, about the, the populations that, that, you know, like how broadly does this, this, this effect actually apply? Um, now, another thing you can do, and in a sense, this would be sort of, if you could do this well, this would obviate most of the other stuff I've talked about, um, is you could make risky uh, predictions or severe tests. So, um, and the idea is just to make a prediction that's, that's so specific to your theory that it's just extremely unlikely that you're, the, the data you would, you would observe uh, you would observe the data you get if your theory was wrong, right? So this is, in some sense, like the, the canonical way to do science, right? tracing back to like Popper. Um, and it's a good way to do science. The problem is it doesn't work so well in most of psychology, right? If you think of how we usually proceed, um, we usually make purely directional predictions. And as you saw in like the ego depletion example, these are, I would almost say completely worthless, but close to it because Psychologists study complex phenomena where there are usually many, many, many explanations for, oh, the effect is positive or negative, right? That's not terribly informative. Um, and so ideally, really, we would want to do better than that. Uh, the best case scenario would be being able to say, our theory predicts a finding effect of 45 milliseconds plus minus five milliseconds. And there are domains where people do computational modeling and do have that kind of precision, and that's wonderful. But uh, it doesn't work in many places. Um, uh, so can we do other things? Yes, we can do equivalence testing. That's helpful to some degree, right? If you can say, well, you know, my theory predicts uh, that the effect should be bigger than X, then that's a start. Although again, the problem is um, confounds often predict basically the same range of effect sizes, right? Like demand characteristics can predict as large an effect as you can as you like. And so it's not clear that sort of predicting a range of effect sizes is that much more helpful in most of psychology, but it's better. Uh, predicting ordering of events is right. So you could say, well, you know, it's not just that the sign goes this way. Maybe I predict that like A is greater than B and B is greater than C and C is greater than D uh, in that exact order, right? So that, that's stronger. Uh, you can make logical conjunctions of predictions. I predict that this effect will hold and this one and this one and this one. And all of these things have to hold uh, in order for me to, to take that as a uh, as, as corroboration of my theory. And if any one of those things doesn't work out, then, you know, my theory is falsified, right? So you have to basically hold your feet to the fire in that way, uh, and so on. So again, I think this is plus something to strive for, and it should be the ideal in some sense, but I don't think it's realistic in, in many, probably most domains of psychology. And so I think it's dangerous to behave as if we're doing uh, severe testing when in fact you could like, you know, drive a truck through the gaps uh, created by the mapping from theory to, to prediction. And the last thing I will argue we could do much more of is focus on predictive utility. So this is different from, from uh, making risky predictions, right? We're still talking about prediction, but now we're not saying what state of affairs would convince us that there's no explanation except that our theory is correct. Instead, we're saying, uh, forget like this notion of truth. 
Uh, are our models good approximations of the data generating process, right? Can we use them to do things in the real world? So instead of saying, you know, is the ego depletion real? We might ask, can we build a statistical model that predicts changes in cognitive performance as a function of previous demands? That's something that might actually be useful in the real world. And if somebody wants to say, oh, but I think that's because of ego depletion or, oh, no, no, that's because people are just being passive aggressive, they can ask that question. At least you have a model that can do demonstrably do something useful. Um, and one benefit of that kind of uh, um, attitude is progress is easier when objective metrics are emphasized, right? So when you have a target that you're trying to hit, um, then it often is easier to make progress because you can evaluate how you're doing against some common benchmark, as opposed to, well, we predict the sign of effect and someone else says, oh yes, but that's not the right uh, effect actually. What you should be looking at is this thing over here. And you can go around in circles doing that. Um, so um, my postdoc Jake and I wrote a ex postdoc Jake wrote a, a, a paper a couple years ago, um, really arguing for that latter point, saying that in psychology we we probably should should emphasize um, um, prediction more, not more than explanation, but more than we have in the past at least uh, at minimum. Uh, so those are all things that I think we can do to help address this problem. And again, I don't want to suggest that certainly not all of them are necessary. Many of them won't apply. Um, and maybe none of them will apply, but I do think that we have options, right? It's not like we just have to throw up our hand and say, well, um, you know, I mean, that's that's also an option. You might throw up your hands and say, well, you know, I guess I'll do something else. But uh, there are options. You can change what the words you're using. You can have narrow descriptions of, of your conclusions. You can fit more expensive models. Uh, you can try and make risky predictions. We have all these options available to us. Uh, so let me just conclude, and then I'm happy to take questions until. Um, uh, people run out of steam or get kicked off. Uh, really, you can sum up this entire this entire talk and paper uh, in the following sentence, right? This is, in a sense, all I'm saying. If you're going to say X supports Y, where X typically is a p-value of some kind, and Y is some verbal claim, uh, verbal hypothesis, it's probably a good idea if X actually does support Y, right? Like, it's not like the, the statistical uh, quantity is just like something you sprinkle on top to make people say, oh yes, now it's real and important. Like it has to mean something. If it doesn't mean something, don't include it. Just say, I believe why, and here's my qualitative evidence, and that's fine. That's also interesting and can be important. Um, that's really the central argument here is that we, if we're going to use statistical uh, values as support, then we need to understand what they're actually telling us and how they relate to the verbal conclusions. And I think that, that I think should be fairly intuitive. But you know, for, for one or another reason, we have a long tradition in psychology of making claims that bear little relation to our data and our models. Um, um, and so I, I think we do have an, an important choice to make. Uh, now, I'm not, I'm not optimistic that, I mean, obviously this is aspirational. I don't know that this or anything in this vein really is going to change much, but, but in principle, we have a choice right, where we could say if we want psychology to be a quantitative science, and again, I don't think there's anything wrong with not wanting that, but if we do, then we need to do better. We need to actually take the quantitative part seriously and not treat it like it's just a ritual that we use to diminish our uncertainty about the world. Um, or we can lose the inferential statistics and stick to qualitative storytelling or qualitative analysis. And that is, I think, a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, but I don't think we get to have it both ways, right? I don't think we could we could present ourselves as doing quantitative science and sort of, you know, I what the physicists are doing uh, enviously. Um, while treating p-values as if they're basically just a kind of magic. Right? That's, I think, deeply problematic. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you of that, and if not, at least given you a little bit to think about. Um, so I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tal. That's an absolutely wonderful talk, I have to say. Uh, we, we have had quite a number of questions um, uh, given to us. So there, there is 12 in total um, and you can either, I guess there's two options, you can just answer them in the order in which they were uh, submitted or I've um, asked people to uh, upvote uh, certain questions so you can sort of go in order of priority, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that's got the most votes is probably the one that is sort of you expected, I guess, mm -hmm. which is a comment on, on Daniel Larkins' criticisms. But I, I can leave it up to you. It's it's whatever you decide, really. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll go in order of upvotes. Um, okay. So the question is: Is can you steal man Daniel Larkin's criticism of your preprint? Uh, 
it's it's hard. I confess it's hard, right? Um, um, I will try. Um, I think, uh, let's see. Um, I, th I think the, the, the kind of the strongest frame I can give it is that I, I agree with Daniel that that I think psychologists don't think they're doing what I suggest they are doing, right? So, so um, um, I think a lot of psychologists think that what they're doing is deduction in the sense that Daniel presents it. And I, as I mentioned in my blog post, I think that what Daniel calls deduction is quite different from what philosophers of science have historically called the, the hypothetical deductive approach. But I do think it's true that, that the, the, the intuitive logic that many people adopt and that I used to follow as well, it says, I have a theory, and look, from that theory, I can, I can sort of reason forward and say, here's a prediction that comes out of that theory. And then I go and I test that, that prediction. It turns out it's confirmed. And that looks like I should get some, some you know, what, what, uh, uh, what Daniel's called falling the money in the bank. I should get money in the bank for that, right? I was able to make a prediction. And that seems uh, important. And so I agree that that is how people, many people think about what they're doing. The problem for reasons that go all the way back to Meal is that it just doesn't work, right? Because what matters is not whether um, you can bring out a prediction from your theory and then confirm it. It's whether that prediction has any specificity. Is it risky? Is it severe? Um, and so that's, I think, the point of departure is that you don't get money in the bank for making a prediction. I gave examples. You don't get money in the bank for saying, uh, I have a theory, therefore adults should be taller than children. Because you can always find some pattern in the world that will give you P less than 0.05. Uh, there has to be some close relationship between these things. So that's one part. Another part I think Steel Man is, uh, you know, so uh, when, you know, Daniel, I think, writes a lot in various ways that, well, you know, this makes science impossible. Um, and if you, again, like, you know, I, I'm trying to Steel Man, it's hard because I really don't think the argument is very good at all, but like the best spin I can put on it is if we stipulate that scientists can only pursue questions as they initially formulated them. So I have a hypothesis and I must answer this question and it's not no good to substitute another question for it, right? Um, then yeah, it might make it impossible because if I started out with a question about ego depletion and then Yarkoni shows up and says, well, you're not really answering anything about ego depletion. That's at best something about a letter cancellation task. Then it might seem kind of impossible, right? Like, I mean, so if I want to study ego depletion, I have to build an arbitrarily complex model and think of every little thing that could possibly make this not ego depletion. Um, and the answer is yes, right? But notice, nothing says, I mean, you're not entitled to be able to ask whatever question you like and expect an answer easily. Um, you can just as easily modify the words you're using. You can say, I'm not actually studying ego, de ego depletion, I'm studying this narrow thing. And so um, that's the best I can do. And I really do think at bottom that the, the fundamental objection is like, this makes it really hard for me to both use inferential statistics and still feel like I'm answering very broad, interesting questions. And I think that's true, but that's the reality. I don't know what you can do about that. Um, so that's that's my take on that. Uh, let's see what's 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 next. Yeah, so uh, um, thank you, Tal, for, for, for uh, answering that one. The next one that has the most votes is the one actually asked uh, after that one, which is um, do random effects models protect us from erroneous conclusions in studies where we have introduced selection bias, e.g. if I have selected stimuli that systematically bias yeah. my effect and so on? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, and the answer is no, right? So, so, and I should mention, I mean, I, this is a subtler point, but it's important. Like, um, you know, th th there's nothing special about random effects. In, in a sense, in an ideal world, you wouldn't have random effects. In an ideal world, you just write down the true data generating process. And it only has fixed effects, right? You don't have a placeholder for like, there's a population of people. You have a term for like, well, what is the age of the person? What is their gender? How tall are they? What do they like? And all these things plug in and then out comes a much more accurate prediction. And so in a sense, the whole idea of like having this distribution sitting there that we're sampling from is just reflective of the fact that we can't possibly say, we can't unpack that and say, here are all the attributes that that actually measures, right? And so when you look at it that way, um, I think it becomes clear that, that like, this is not, I mean, random effects models cannot protect you from almost anything, except they can capture the idea that there's a population you're generalizing to. Now, what that population is, is a separate question. So, um, you know, the, the kind of, the really kind of interesting quirk of, of inferential statistics as they're used throughout the social sciences, really, but primarily, well, heavily in psychology at least, is that we actually invent the population to fit the sample and not the other way around, right? So if you think of like clinical drug trials, with massive resources, they're very careful usually about how they sample people. Right? So they define a population and they go out and they try to get representative sampling and they're very careful about that. 
Uh, when we do convenience cycling psychology, which is largely unavoidable, we basically get whoever we can get, and then we say, okay, now let's imagine there's a population here. What is the population that we were sampling from hypothetically in order to get these observations? And it's it's very it's interesting, right? Because you're essentially idealizing a population just so you can say there's something you're generalizing to. And I would want to minimize that. I think that's still a huge, huge improvement over saying, well, we only are talking about this sample. But it is not the case that um, knowing that you can generalize to a population entitles you to say, you know, uh, this is the population I care about. And the classical example of this is like weird samples, right? So like just because you have uh, random effects for subjects, if all your subjects are, you know, white, upper class and rich, uh, you probably are not generalizing to the population you care about, unless that's the population you're interested in. Or you have some good reason to think that there's not that much difference. So later you're studying like basic perceptual processes, you can get away with saying, look, it's unlikely that basic perceptual processes are different depending on like income level or, you know, uh, various other things. Um, but so that's an excellent question. No, it, it cannot guard against that. And and, and, um, and actually, let me maybe go back to the, the previous question, right? So uh, if I wanted to steal money, you, you could say, look, again, like, like at some point you have to say stop, right? Like you, you can only do so well. And I think that's right. Of course, you have to at some point say like, this is the best I can do. Again, all I would say is that moderate your conclusion accordingly, like recognize that you are not entitled to say, I had a random effect, therefore I'm generalizing to all of humanity. You can say like, there's a population of people. Uh, we know that this applies beyond just the four people in our study. It's harder to say what that is. Great. Uh, well, as the next question, I guess, could be very related to that. So it, um, I'm just going above now. So it's usually people try to balance their stimuli on the types of categories you mentioned, such as length, familiarity, why is random effects models for stimuli better than this balancing method? Um, well, so um, the, the question there is, I guess, comes to like, how much do you trust yourself, right? So let's forget stimuli for the moment. You could say exactly the same thing for subjects. Um, why don't we say, look, instead of just randomly sampling 30 people and modeling random effects, why don't we make sure that we sample a, a we select a representative group of people? And then we can say, well, you know, we know that the sample is representative humanity, so we don't need to model random effects. And, you know, uh, we get, uh, well, we have a more precise estimate. And the answer is because it's hard to trust yourself. That's true, right? Uh, and the same thing with stimuli. Um, um, if you really feel confident that you could select 10 nouns and 10 verbs that balance on all the unobservable variables that confound the noun versus verb category, um, okay. But that's a very strong assumption. I think it's almost impossible to defend in most areas of psychology. And actually, I think this is another case where I think the people mean well, and, and but the, the the effort to do that. So you see this a lot in like psycholinguistics, right? Where like the effort to balance this group of words against this group of words on like these six dimensions is actually problematic because and there's interesting work on this. Right? Like you know. If there are other dimensions you're not thinking about, like maybe there's 300 differences and you've controlled six, you're actually squashing, you're basically selecting the least representative words, right? Because to, to get like to get high frequency words and low frequency words that are matched on word length, for instance, you have to select the, the like unusual words in either category because these two variables tend to be highly correlated. And so matching can actually be quite dangerous. You can actually induce more bias on unobserved dimensions by trying to match for uh, a, a restricted set of dimensions if you don't have it quite right. Um, but yeah, I mean, in principle, if you feel super confident that you know exactly what generated your stimuli and that they're representative of exactly the population you want, then yeah, you don't need to, you know, you can just, you can just uh, ignore the, the role of stimuli. Okay, um, so we are just to let you know, we have five more questions, um, <laughs> but perhaps we just deal with these, finish these 12 off first before, um, uh, you sort of die of fatigue or anything. Um, so the next one is, do meta-analyses with random effects models address any of the generalizability issues? Um, uh, yes, yeah, so let me just find that. Yeah, it's, uh, it was at 3.44 p.m. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just... Uh... You find it? Yeah, sorry, I just uh, randomly clicked on something. Uh, yes, uh, do you remember? 
Um, well, yes, yes. I mean, I think the answer is yes in, in the same sense that meta-analyses address any question, right? So if you can formulate your question at a meta-analytic level, then exactly the same things apply. Um, you know, if you only had, so if you're doing a meta-analysis and you have uh, eight studies and they're all from the same lab and they're all from the same research site, possibly even the same experimenter, then any conclusion you you generate from the meta analysis has all the same problem, right? It is essentially an estimate of like what this lab produces, and um, so you know that's the exactly the same argument applies to. That's also the reason why you should probably always, with maybe some exceptions, do random effects meta analysis and not fixed effects meta analysis. It's the same exact logic, um, but it doesn't. It's not like it's magic. I mean, you still have the same problem where like if you want to generalize over. You know the nth factor. You kind of have to have variation in your data for that. If you have um, uh, a meta analysis, and you might have 300 data sets, but if they all use the same task operationalization, like they all, you call it a meta analysis ego depletion, but they're all letter cancellation tasks, or maybe two or three tasks, then exactly the same problem applies, right? Like there's no population of tasks you're modeling there, so maybe you should just say this is a meta analysis of the letter cancellation task. Um, so yeah, in principle. Yes, but in practice, it's sort of the same exact issues applying. There's nothing special about meta analysis in the sense, except insofar as, of course, um, you know, it might be easier to get lots of data and, and maybe to get data that are diverse and span a wider uh, set of observations. Okay, great. Um, so the next uh, one uh, would be, uh, I guess, there's the one at uh, 3:49 p.m., which is uh, you. Have, I guess this is a hypothetical. So. You have just one published study showing effect X. The experiment is not a good operationalization of the hypothesis and doesn't model stimuli as random effects, but the result is highly cited. Is this case, uh, i.e. just one influential study, are you justified in conducting a close replication? Can you find that one? It's called a uh, one. Sorry, what time? Uh, three forty nine. It's got three votes. I do the translation because for me shows up as a nine forty nine. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, all right, fine. I'll you. Sorry, I just looked that easier for me to. I'm actually just buying time. I read it and pretend like I'm reading, but really I'm just thinking about the question. <laughs> okay, sure. um, um, you know, I so I think it's it's a matter of opinion. So I think um, well, okay. Here's the here's actually I'm glad this question came out because this is of people who I think are sympathetic to the argument I, I just made. Probably the most common pushback I guess when I get when I say, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't try to replicate lots of highly influential studies is um, well, look, that there's value in showing that this thing doesn't actually do what it says, right? Like it's it's you know, I mean, maybe it's rhetorical in one sense, but like there are people working on problems. Um, and if you can show that, hey, you take this experiment from 1973 and you do it again carefully and you don't get anything, maybe that convinces those people that they shouldn't do this kind of work. Now, I see the appeal of that, um, right? So yeah, let's. It's, the field thinks it's important, so let's pursue it and we'll maybe find out that it doesn't work out and then people can move on. That's a very dangerous line of reasoning. And the reasoning is, I think I alluded to this in my talk, sometimes you get the result, and that puts you in a very weird position. It's very uncomfortable to say like, it's sort of a bait and switch. At that point, you have to say, like, well, yeah, OK, fine. Look, here, let me lay my cards on the table. I only did this replication because I thought it wouldn't turn out. I thought it would fail, and then we could all get on with our lives. Now that it hasn't failed and succeeded, now I have to kind of resort to telling you what I really think, which is this is just not a good test of the theory in the first place, right? That's not a good place to be in. I think um, a better approach would be to say, look, from the get-go, I think this is not a good test of the theory. I don't think we should do this, but since there seems to be a lot of investment, Fine, let's go ahead with the understanding that this is not going to answer what the, the original theoretical claim. It will just tell you something about the conditions under which the particular effect holds. And if you still think that's interesting, OK. Um, so in general, I guess I would say I'm, I'm not super positive about replicating influential effects just for the sake of it. But uh, there certainly can be cases where it makes sense to do that. OK, there's another uh, as a question by Nicholas. Um, uh, is it the responsibility of a theory to specify all sources of variability that we should model? Uh, no, I think the answer is, is clearly not. Uh, what I do think is, I mean, and that that certainly would be impossible, right? Um, what I think is, is it's the theory, of, it's the responsibility of a theory, uh, or of an author, I should say. I don't think theory is a responsibility. I think 
authors have responsibility to specify sources of variance that they can, after having thought about it for a long time, not just like, well, I had this idea sitting here for five minutes, that they anticipate uh, seem likely to play some important role. Right? Now, of course, it can turn out that things that you had no way of, of anticipating are important. It could turn out that like, you know, some uh, really large effect actually depends on some esoteric timing parameter that you just didn't think about it. Nobody else could have thought about it. And it would be crazy to say, uh, sorry, you shouldn't have published that paper because you, you didn't think about it. You know. um, so that would be impossible. But um, there's a big, big gap, I think, between the way many of us proceed, which is you kind of come up with an idea. It seems to make sense in your head. And so you just sort of come up with an operating basically. Basically, you proceed in the forward direction without ever asking yourself what other sources of variance are important and what would have, what could have produced the same result, right? So I would say it's the responsibility of an author to try to anticipate to the degree they can, uh, yeah, having spent a good amount of time thinking about it, um, what confounds might arise, and not just to think of it as like a 50-50 thing, like 50% chance I'm right, 50% chance I'm wrong, or it's other people's responsibility to tell me that I should have thought about demand characteristics, right? Like there's large classes of confounds psychology that are so obvious that you really kind of have to, at least I kind of feel like the only explanation is that we've just kind of developed this culture of like it's not our problem, right? Because nobody who sits through a few classes of psychology can fail to recognize that demand characteristics are a real thing and that's a problem and you should think about it and you should worry about blinding, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you don't do that, I think that's a problem. That really is your responsibility, right? It's not, your, your goal should be to try and falsify your hypothesis and not to just throw it against the wall and wait till somebody else shows up and says, ah, maybe this other thing is, is responsible. Um, OK, so we're we're going through the sort of towards the end of the first batch of 12. If, if you're still happy to carry on, there's um, <laughs> so we have a question by Alexander Bird. Um, he's a philosopher at, at King's um, and he's he's put together a short essay for you, um, <laughs> but I think I, with a fear of sort of information loss, I think I think he he wants a comment on internal validity and external validity, and whether there's a place for the qualitative analysis uh, in the external and the internal being more sort of the statistical stuff to establish the internal validity. Um. It's interesting. I mean, I probably, I probably should have thought about that before. I can't say I have. Uh, I don't think that I, don't, I wouldn't. I don't think I've mapped a quantitative qualitative distinction onto internal and external in that way. Um, if for no other reason that you know, whether you're doing quantitative or qualitative uh, psychology, clearly both of these things should matter, right? I mean, um, you can like if you're doing purely qualitative research, you can ask like, look, do these claims I'm making actually make sense in relation to one another, or you could say. Do I have evidence that this applies to some other situation? And the same thing for quantitative um, approaches. So um, yeah, I'd have to think about it. It's hard to distill that question uh, down looking at it. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd prefer if you did a more lengthy sort of read of it because I feel like I butchered his question. You've probably answered something. That yeah. So maybe uh, let, me, let me let me take shorter ones yeah. and then if, if there's time, I'll come back to that. Yeah, OK. Well, what I'll do is I'll just open the the gates for the other five uh, questions. So um, I'll just publish those now. And these are quite short ones. There are a couple that we haven't finished yet from the previous batch, but um, I'll just let, I'll let them in anyway so people can upvote them and avoid answering any, any other ones. So um, we did have a question earlier. Well, we had two questions from one person, uh, Thomas, I think his name. Um, his first question was the first question that was asked, actually, um, which is, can your argument be interpreted as a reductio ad absurdum? Uh, have you found that one? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, right to the question is, yeah, uh, I don't think so. So I think, and actually I'm glad this was brought up too. So um, I'm actually in general, it may not seem that way, but I'm, I'm actually pretty much agnostic about the question of like how valuable is theory in psychology and how much do you need theory, right? So I personally think in lots of domains, it's wishful thinking. Basically the, the kind of the higher you go, like the closer you get to like social psychology is distinct from like basic physiological processes. The harder it is for me to think that actually theory is, is gonna be terribly useful. Um, 
So I'm not saying like, you know, if you don't have a, a formal theory of the phenomenon, don't even try. Um, again, all I'm really saying is that your claims should match the evidence you claim to provide. And I'm perfectly okay with purely descriptive research. So I'm totally fine with someone saying, look, I didn't have a hypothesis. I went out, I gathered a bunch of data. It's purely exploratory, but the interpretation should still match what the statistical model you fit actually supports, right? So you, you still shouldn't say we've shown that, you know, here's a point estimate for all of humanity. Don't say that if it's not true. Whether you have a theory that, that, that generated the, the, the design or the model, et cetera, uh, I think it's better if you do than if you don't, other things being equal, but other things aren't equal. And I don't have really any particular, uh, I wouldn't argue that, that, you know, it's not worth doing cognitive science or any other field of psychology if you don't have a formal theory that maps, um, uh, you know, the theoretical objects in your head onto the, the, the statistic ones. You could proceed in the opposite, I guess is what I'm saying. It's perfectly fine to say, just, you know, here's my rough sense of what is an interesting set of data to collect. And once I've done that, then I'll project back. And maybe you can argue you still need a mapping there and so fine, right? But but the commitment to like having a theory that generates the the hypothesis for you, I think I don't I certainly don't don't subscribe to that. Okay, and the other question from Thomas was um the your reducto ad absurdum is in fact the core of Chomsky's critique of Skinner's gerrymandered opera operationalizations. I guess that's more of a comment. I don't know whether you want to comment yeah. on that. Yeah. That's that's interesting. So I don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't know my history of psychology super well. Uh, okay. I did, I did learn a little bit out of the cognitive revolution, et cetera, but I don't, I don't, I guess I don't see the, I don't see the, the, the relationship right now. So I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll give the benefit of the doubt and say I should probably read up on that. Okay. So in that case, we'll just move on to the new five that we've got. So the one that's already gone up vote is by uh, Leo. Uh, and it starts, do you feel that co the current incentive structure to make a career in the field? Uh, so do you want to just read through that and then? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, wait, let's... Yeah, um, yeah, so I think, well, so there's no, there's absolutely no question that, that um, you are incentivized to various degrees to make broader claims, right? And so I think, um, there is a version of the argument that says, you know, like what I'm saying is super impractical. It really, if you kind of, I think, scratch under the surface, just boils down to like, it's not impractical in the sense that it's more work. It's impractical in the sense that it makes it harder to publish. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that it's, you know, like I gave the example of like the ego depletion thing, right? If, if you did replace ego depletion with like a letter cancellation task, then would journals like Psych Science want to publish that? Great, you've shown that when you get people a difficult task compared to an easy one, after a little while, they, you know, the change is responding, responding some way. Is that interesting? It might not be, right? Um, so, yeah, I do think that there are obviously incentives to, uh, let's say, oversell and overgeneralize. Um, you know, I've, I've written about this in the past on my blog. I guess I'm not terribly swayed by that in the sense of, like, of course, it's an explanation. It's an explanation for why people might uh, uh, overgeneralize. But I don't see it as a justification prospectively, right? So it feels weird to me to say, like, like if you're sitting there saying, well, yeah, no, I, get, I get it, but I kind of have to say this because otherwise my papers won't be published, then my question to you would be, and you can read my post, I wrote a long post about this, but my question to you would be, like, why do you think that, like, once you get this published, uh, you're going to put yourself in a position to stop doing this, right? Like, I think it's naive to think that, like, okay, I'll, I just need to stay in the system. But once I'm tenured, then totally, then I'll start publishing much, much more modest claims. And that definitely won't, you know, make my friends think, huh, right? Like, my, I'll just throw my reputation out the window. And it, that's unlikely, right? So I guess my, my take on that is like, there's no question that, that the incentives, that we disincentivize accurate, modest reporting. But I also think it's, it's it, you disadvantage yourself if you, if you, give into that because I just don't see a world in which that changes anytime soon. Like people don't change from the inside, right? So like, and also why would you, like if you don't fundamentally believe that the claims support are supported by the data, why would you want to do that work in the first place, right? So um, so that's a little bit of a cop for me, but that, that is essentially what I did, right? If you look at my publication record, my first 10 papers are fairly conventional psychology and then I just stopped doing that work because I don't believe in it. And the fact that I might get tenure for it does not like, Okay, so what? So then I turn around and say, ha, fooled you. That was just for tenure. Now I'll tell you what I really think. Um, so uh, that may or may not be helpful, I don't know, but but I, I certainly agree with the premise. Like, of course, there are there are um, yeah, there are uh, incentives that favor 
not following maybe it's not all the suggestions I just I just uh, proposed. OK, very good. Uh, so we have one that's got a bit of attention. Um, the top one, which is uh, I think boo, 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 sievers. Um, uh, so what's a good way of knowing when a factor is not reasonable to include in a mix? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I tend to fall on the side of like, if you tell me what your reasoning is, I can draw my own conclusions, right? So like, um, now I'm not saying obviously, you know, like it would be like impossible to say like, well, here are all the things we thought about and didn't include. Um, I, I kind of will say what I said several questions ago, which is like, you know, you have to use your judgment. And for me, the problem is not that we don't have a deterministic or even a heuristic rule for deciding what should or shouldn't be included. It's that we clearly don't make much of an effort, right? So like, I could happily live in a world where um, you pick up a site paper and it's clear that people made an earnest effort to think about the big various components. And if they didn't think about, or, you know, or if they threw out something that I might think is important, um, but they genuinely didn't, didn't think that mattered, I can live with that. Um, I don't think you could argue that's the world we live in right now, right? So I, I, I don't think anybody could argue like, yes, people think about it and they've decided that the only thing that makes sense to model are subjects as random effects and everything else, people are you know, are making an, an active judgment that uh, other things don't matter, right? That's clearly not the case. Um, now, down the line, if you imagine more studies fitting sort of more expansive models and reporting variance components, right? So if you have variances reported alongside, then over time that answer that question would be much easier to answer. So then it could be the case, I can imagine in the best case scenario, like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, uh, you want to do a study of ego depletion, and there are hundreds of studies that have reported um, mixed effects models and reported variance estimates. And now I can come along and say, well, it looks like, you know, these things seem important, these ones don't, and maybe there's just not much variance left over after, you know, all these things are accounted for. Um, so I don't have a, certainly a, a deterministic solution. I'm happy to leave it to people's judgment, but I think that judgment should be um, uh, earned, right? I mean, it, it, there should be a, a standard, I think, that expects the onus is on the author and not on like, I clearly get away with what I can, and then other people will tell me what I'm what I'm missing. Uh, I think you might be muted. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, okay. uh, there, is a, there is a question by anonymous, which is uh, the answer to the first question is an appeal to the man on the street, but I'm not sure what. Yeah, I saw that, yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure. Maybe if the person wants to follow up, I don't yes. know what that means. If that person could just clarify that. Uh, so we'll go on to the next one. So uh, are there domains where variability is negligible? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I think, um, well, OK, I want to say yes. Um, when every time I say yes and I talk to people who work in that field, they tell me no, actually, so like, you know, I talk to psychophysicists and I always give psychophysics an example where like, um, stimuli, again, this is my intuition, intuitively it seems to me like stimuli shouldn't matter. Now, I want to be clear, if I were doing experimental psychophysics, I would think a lot harder about that. But my intuition is, uh, you know, which like, like if you're like, I don't know, studying like brightness or something, it shouldn't matter too much what the shape is. And actually my psychophysicist and assure me that that's not true. And actually there's sometimes very large stimulus effects. Um, having said that, there clearly are cases where those variance components are small or negligible. If you actually, it's interesting, if you go and look at some of the, the registered replication reports that have many sites, uh, it turns out that actually site effects are often surprisingly small. So um, I'm thinking in particular of like the verbal overshadow, no, uh, sorry, not the, um, no, the, the, I think it's the STRAC, the, which I've realized that the STRAC, um, you know, the, the pencil holding one, whatever. And they're like, site is a fairly small effect. And so that's surprising to me, but I do think there are, there are certainly gonna be cases where you can either from theoretical grounds or ideally empirical ones say, look, this is something that we now think we don't need to worry about. We could be wrong, of course, but um, so again, use your best judgment. Um, but I do think that there's there certainly will be lots of cases where, uh, and again, the example of like like worrying about something for breakfast, obviously you're not gonna worry about that, right? Like, does that mean it could never matter? No, it could, but it's just not a reasonable thing to, to worry about. Um, I think that, I think what a lot of these questions are getting at is like, it, it's, it's uncomfortable, right? Because there's so much uncertainty. But one theme of the talk is like, that's actually real uncertainty. You can't avoid it. You can only contend with it and say like, to the best of our ability, we've thought about this a lot, we've gotten empirical estimates, this is the best we can do. It's totally fine if it's not perfect. It's not going to be perfect, but do make an effort to contend with it. And then if you disagree with someone else over what's important, 
make your data available. They can come along, they can insert their own assumptions, etc. Uh, okay, well, the other person who uh, asked the other question hasn't clarified, so we'll just finish perhaps with the, the last one, which is, do you think random effects will change much? Researchers will yield slightly higher p-values, but still only interpret fixed effects. Um, let me just... Uh, Oh, sorry, that's new. Um, it's Peter, yeah. yeah. Um, wait, sorry, no, that's not new. Uh, no, there's some. Sorry, I keep looking. I just want to make sure that I'm not misinterpreting the question. That's why I want to yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Well, so, I mean, yes, in the sense that, I mean, like the Ranifex model has been around forever, right? I mean, like, um, um, Jake Westfall pointed me to a nice paper by Tukey from like 1956 that, that talks about that distinction very clearly. Um, and so and it has clearly made a difference in the sense that we all, with very few exceptions, model subjects as random effects. Now you will get almost always dramatically different p-values, well I shouldn't say dramatically, but certainly meaningfully different uh, p-values when you model subjects as fixed or random because there's almost always large variance associated with subject sampling. So it has changed much. Um, and um, it clearly is stimulated the same thing. There are domains now, like psycholinguists, again, by, by and large, do model stimulated random facts that just hasn't bled over to other domains. So, you know, one way this could go is like, over time, slowly, people will recognize more and more, okay, if that matters, we need to worry about that and so on. And that does have an effect. Um, but if the question is more like, in principle, if people were to fit more expansive models, would that have an impact? Um, I think the answer is yes, because when you build in even just a few of these things, you usually get shockingly different p values. And the biggest lesson maybe is that um, sample size matters in every dimension you want to generalize over. So if you care to generalize over stimuli, but you only have four stimuli, you're going to have a bad time, right? You're probably going to get p values that are nowhere near significant. Um, and so it will push you to think about your design and recognize that if you want to make claims about, you know, experimenter effect, you need to have not just two experimenters, but probably a bunch. Um, um, now, if you, again, last thing I'll say about this, if, of course, if you're asking, like, do I realistically, is my prediction for what will actually happen, that there will be some sea change in practice and, uh, you know, we'll all be singing songs in the park and holding hands? No, of course not. I mean, it would be naive of me to think that like I'm going to, my paper is going to have some influence that like Gelman and Gigerenzer and Meal and dozens of other people have not had before. I think it's all about very small, you know, like the best case I think is like some small proportion of people take these arguments seriously and change what they do, right? That's the best anybody can hope for, I think. Uh, and I'm, I, I will happily, I go to bed happy if like, you know, like, like 10 people read this paper and think, okay, I'm going to change what I do going forward. That's a, a good result. Uh, well, I know we have one more in the sort of lobby waiting, but I, I, I have a, a one question. I have several questions, but you can sort of choose which one. I mean, it was mainly... You have off to write it down, though. I'm not, I don't answer questions. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, so it was because of uh, listening to podcasts in preparation for this, there was, there was a conversation about what your view of conceptual versus direct replications are. I don't know whether you think that you've satisfactorily answered that in uh, via Twitter. Um, but my other question was, was how do you think that, uh, what uh, value does say the multiverse or specification curve uh, analysis has? Because you can sort of robustly test in different ways uh, your 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 data set, different hypotheses, and so on. Could that be a, a potential tool in the toolkit? Yes. So let, let me take the, the second question first. So absolutely. So I think conceptually, um, multiverse analysis does very similar things to explicitly building into your model uh, random effects, right? I mean, the question you're asking either way is like, um, would your conclusions hold under some change in conditions? Now that change could be resampling of the observations, which is what the, the random effects or mixed effect model will give you. It could be changing um, other modeling assumptions like different covariates you include. Um, uh, it, and I will also say that cross-validation also can achieve very much the same thing. Right? So if you're doing predictive modeling, the conceptual equivalent, there it doesn't really make sense to think of like random effects. Or, you, you don't add variance components to like um, 
uh, to neural network models, for example, although there's work there as well. But um, what you can do is you can cross validate. Um, you can basically evaluate your model out of sample in a systematic way. So maybe you build your model against uh, you know, males and then you test whether it performs well on females. And so you're generalizing over gender or you do that for if you're, you know, uh, marketing some new product. You build a model to eight cities and then you see if you do well predicting performance in the ninth. Right. And conceptually that gets at the same thing. It's like, can your model generalize beyond in, in systematic ways beyond uh, just the observations you fitted on? So, yeah, so there's lots of ways to go about that. And, and it's, I'm glad you asked that because it's not it's not like random effects again. They're not magic. It's just one really good way of getting the alignment between what you're saying, you, you, what your claim is and what your, the support for that is. Um, as far as uh, 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 replication studies go, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I used to be, well, I'm still kind of against conceptual replication, but but so my view of conceptual replication is it depends on what you mean. Um, in principle, if you do the like conceptual application in a, in, a, in a principled way, which is to say, you know, the best case scenario is you start out by saying, look, we're going to, we're interested in ego depletion. We know that ego depletion can be operationalized in many, many ways. And so we are going to upfront say, here are 12 different tasks that we all think, that we think all reflect among other things, they measure or they manipulate ego depletion. And we've taken pains to construct these in such a way that um, we're trying to, to rule out alternative content. So you try to come up with tasks that, you know, preclude different classes of alternative explanations. And then we'll go out and we'll do these study one, two, three, four, all the way through 12. In a sense, you could call that a convert, uh, uh, a conceptual replication. And then I would say that's an absolutely, that's, that's probably the optimal thing to do. However, I will also say that if you're doing that, if you're in a position to do that, you probably should just model all that as a just model task as a random factor, right? And so in a sense, it's, it's, or it's almost equivalent to doing a random effects meta analysis on those studies. And so, it becomes almost terminological. Do you call that a conceptual replication or do you just call that a realization? Same way you could say like the 21st subject is a conceptual replication of the 20th subject, right? But we don't think of it that way. Um, what I, I'm very much against are cons uh, conceptual applications in the way they're often practiced in like JPSB, where it's very clear that it's like you got the effect you want and you thought, well, I need to show something else. And you came up with some other half baked, um, not principle that you know, has all the same problems, operationalization, and then you tested it, but it didn't work out. So you found a moderator, and you know, that's obviously bad. But that's not bad because of the conceptual replication aspect. It's bad because the context it's usually embedded in. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, we have I've closed the questions now uh, because I think the AV team need to go home at some point. Um, but we do have one last question, which I think could be um, quickly answered, which is uh, I'll just publish it now. Uh, so you can see that right at the end, which is the are random effects infeasible for many research questions with a good incremental step and so on. Um, yeah, so I think I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. So so um, research site is a really good one. You often don't have the capacity to do the same the same study at multiple sites. So how could you model site as a random factor? Or maybe you only have one experiment or a small number, right? That's actually that's the norm probably. Um, so I, I'm not, again, I'm not really clear. I'm not saying that if you can't model everything you think is important, you shouldn't do a study. I'm saying that you should then moderate your conclusions. If you, if you think there's good reason to think that you would get different results if the study was done in London versus in Austin, Texas, you might want to mention that, right? Now, if you think there's no reason to expect that, maybe it's not important. But um, so it's not, it's not, the, it's not that um, you shouldn't do it unless you can do it this way. It's that you should just moderate your conclusions accordingly. I will also say that it's, again, it's not, Kind of a little bit mentions too. It's, there's nothing special about random effects. They're just a good way and a, a simple way of representing the idea that there's a population there. Um, there are lots of domains like you know psychophysics is a good one, right? Like if you can actually come up with a, a, a quantitative mathematical functional form relating on a stimulus intensity to perceived responses or something, arguably that's much better, right? If you can show me, look, I have this very specific prediction that when I do this, people's responses first go up and then they go down. I'm not going to sit there and say, OK, yeah, but what about like is subject random, right? If, it, if that's the whole point of, of severity of risk, if you are in a domain where you can make a, a prediction that it's just obvious that you couldn't explain this in any other way, then in a sense, the statistics become kind of irrelevant, right? And that, the best case scenario, quite honestly, is where you don't need inferential statistics. That's a better situation to be in than one where, yes, you can do stats, but you can't get all the random effects. So 
you should always be thinking like, could I have built a purely qualitative prediction that's so compelling that nobody needs to appeal to statistics? It's just very, very hard to do that in most areas of psychology. Okay, wonderful. So, well, that wraps up the Q and A. Thank you so much, uh, Tal, for for spending so much time answering all those questions. Yeah, uh, and, and yes, thanks, thanks so much. So, what I will do is I'll I'll end the the live feed. You can stay on the call. Uh, it would just end the feed. Um, so, thank you again, and uh, see everybody next week when we have a talk from um, Mittel Meta and. Uh, and Dabba uh, that will talk about fast track research in uh, the sort of coronavirus pandemic. So I'll close it now. Uh, and the